Hello and welcome back to Mutiny, where we get down to the hard facts that you really want to know about. Once again, I am, or it's me, Corey, the first time joining you with this, and uh, I have a few people with me. If you guys want to say hello. Hey, it's Jason. And Rachel. Back again. So, a little bit of a different uh, squad here to guide you through these interesting topics of debate. And we'll get into that, but you guys are doing good today? Yeah, I'm tired. I um, It was one of those evenings where I slept for ten and a half hours, and I woke up and I'm still tired. So, yeah, oh, wow. it's, uh, it's, it's a bachelor weekend for myself. Uh, my family are all visiting the in-laws, so I and I had to get some editing done. And also had a game last night, so I was like, well, you guys can go hang out with the in-laws and eat pizza and shoot the shit and have fun, and I'll be here and work. But then I have fun. I had fun. I played in my first session of Wrath of the Righteous last night, and that was a phenomenal time. Nice. Doing good, too. I played my in-person homebrew game yesterday, so it's weird recording in the morning, as we are. But Yeah, this, uh, this came together a little bit quicker. I saw an opportunity and figured we should uh, see what we can do. Um, mm-hmm. Playing Wrath is cool. Quick question. How does your GM say the main city's name? Tenabris? Or Canabris? Canabris? Okay. Yeah. That's how I figured, but you just never know until you hear somebody else say it, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I believe um, we knew it was pronounced Canabras because the computer RPG just came out last year, and it's fully voice acted. So, right. So I think yes. we we have the we have the luxury of official Paizo pronunciation in the computer RPG that we can we can lean on. Wonderful. Yeah, I uh, I should check that game out here. Um, you can make some interesting choices, I've heard, and they removed a lot of the, the mechanics that made Kingmaker kind of a drag. Um, so, yeah, good on you, Paizo, for making good games. It's uh, it's nice seeing a, I, oh, geez, intellectual properties being brought over to other forms of media without it sucking now. Um, we all know those 10, 15 years of, you know, cartoons made into movies where all you want to do is forget they exist. Thanks, M. Night Shyamalan. I'm going to uh, blame you for this one. You can get at me at Twitter <laughs> if you got issues with it, but Avatar was bad. Uh, let's, let's not forget the um, early 90s Captain America movie, too. Ooh, I think that one has skirted under my radar. Yeah, you, got, you, you, you two are both significantly younger than I am, so... <laughs> I mean, there's still some bad crossover. Like the, the newer Hobbit is awful; shouldn't <laughs> exist. There is one redeeming thing about the new Hobbit movies. Mm, disagree. And that Singing. was Thor, the guy who sang, sang Thor, who played Thor. Oh, yeah, that's true. The music was good. Um, Richard Armitage is good, and the music was phenomenal. Yeah. I, uh, so we can listen to the soundtrack, just not watch yeah, the movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I will admit I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to a lot of Tolkien in the sense I haven't managed to read any of the books, even as an avid reader. Um, I found it was too wordy and too dry at times, even though the writing is clearly beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's easy to get lost in your meaning. Um, and I think mm-hmm. the same can be said about characters. See, there's our little our little foray. Yeah, nice transition. Yeah. Great segue. Um, Hero point. Oh, I'll take it. Um, so with that, I figured today, why don't we just ha- have a little conversation about creating realistic, c- grounded characters in what is clearly a non-realistic, ungrounded world of Galarian. How do you bring a character to life without them just being a stat block and a number of feats and skills? And... With that, the different styles that people bring to the table when trying to build these characters. Um, A lot of people I've played with over the years have heard me mention, I design all my characters in the shower. Um, Where they're from, their names, how they sound, it all comes to me in the shower, which is good because I do it every day. But with that, there's no real thoughts when it comes to feats or skills, um or necessarily even class at times. 
which I know can be quite opposite. Um, how do you guys generally go about building or coming up with your concepts in the least um, for the games that you're playing? Yeah, um, I'm probably pretty much the exact opposite. I usually join a group. There's some role that needs to be filled class-wise, or there's a feat. Like for Sill, I had looked at Swashbuckler or something for some other game, didn't do it, but I saw the Forberry feet and really wanted to play a character that had that. Um, so I just kind of look at the feet and the class and then just as I go through the ancestries and the feats, just the personality and the backstory starts piecing together for me. So almost the complete opposite of what it sounds like you do. And for me, I I always when I when I play characters, I generally like to fill a role too. And I think I think that's just a perpetual GM in me, is that hey, you players play what you want. And then I can I, you know, I can fill the gaps here. So generally I end up being stuck with um and I say stuck even though it's my favorite thing to play. I generally end up playing support characters. And I'm completely fine with it because um most people know me and most people know that my main class that I've played more than any other class is the cleric. I really enjoy being the support, being the healer, um, especially in Pathfinder 2, because it's so much more satisfying doing that in second edition. But generally my, my philosophy is once I know my party role, I, then I look at the personality of that character because the personality helps inform the feats. So what kind of character do I want to play? And I'll bring up a couple examples here, because um, in Rachel's game, I'm in a game, uh, this is a private, unrecorded game with of Abomination Vaults. I'm playing a gnome life oracle. So I knew I was going to play a life oracle, and I was like, okay, well, let's take a look at the personality that I want to bring to this. And I always like to lean on a bit of my own personality that I hyper focus and magnet and uh, magnify to create that character. So the my my gnome character, his name is Quajai. He is a I chose war veteran for him, but really the aspect of my personality that I'm hyper focusing and I'm magnifying is trauma. He is a a survive uh, a war survivor and has gone through a lot of personal trauma. And so I combine that with the idea of this life oracle who has a life mystery and they have this outpouring of positive life energy and I then so I just put those two together. The character I'm playing in Wrath of the Righteous is a dwarf wizard and uh, the aspect of my personality for those who, who are unfamiliar I I've I have a post uh, postgraduate degree um, and I really hyper focused on that academia me going through my graduate program and a lot of the get get a lot of influences from the professors and from myself when I had to go and defend my thesis in front of my panel and everything. So I that academic per, uh, persona kind of a bit of throwing a bit of arrogance, throw a bit of uh, condescension in there. And um, yeah, so I don't know where where to go from there. So <laughs> I'll let you take it. No, for sure. Um I design my characters much the same, as I pick a, an emotional facet that I feel I'm lacking or is important and needs to be explored. And I think it's really interesting how TTRPGs give us access to work through things like trauma or little sides of ourselves that we don't know that well. Um, I also played a life oracle at one point named Toshi, um, and Toshi, much the same, had almost, I would say... It was trauma, but it was more abandonment. 
and I built him when I was at a point where I was very low. I was depressed. I was lonely. Um, so Toshi was colorblind. It was just the way that it came to me. The world was without color to him. He was all about keeping his party alive through various skills that would bring the damage to him because of a level of nihilism. Um, I played a dwarf, great, sh sh great tower shield master. This was one first edition. And his whole objective in life was keeping people alive after multiple parties had died before on him. Um, so sometimes those emis emotional standpoints are interesting. So Helgram, with being the defender, I created when I found the time when I was going back into the fire service. I had left for a number of years after a quite particularly gruesome car accident that I responded to. So Helgram came about when I was putting myself back in the line of fire. Um, trying to help people, trying to protect the community around me. Um, even Rizzerk is a uh, extension of one of those kind of deeper emotions, but I'll leave that one up to the guesses until we see what people think his core um, really is. Um, do you find that little facets of yourself find their way into your character creation as well, Rachel? Yeah, I'd say so. So I don't usually... I usually think of the character and their personality is loosely formed. I write a few paragraphs about their backstory, but then inevitably, as I play the character, it's like, oh, that's a fast, like, some part of me is in the character. Uh, so, you know, I, lately I seem to play a lot of characters who end up in a mom role, which is interesting uh you know come to the fantasy world uh to be the mom again so but <laughs> unavoidable i guess uh, well and from what i've gathered uh your current character was never intended to be the mom role no yeah sil was not going to be a mom role in my mind it was you know sil's got pretty high charisma despite being thief racket and it's like, Oh, this will be my fun, you know, kind of chaotic character. You know, I can, I can be silly despite being a mom. Uh, and then we got in the game. It was like, Oh, Sarah's just plays an amazing random chaotic character. I'm not, I'm not going to out chaos Sarah. So just kind of, nope. yeah, I find my characters are very, I don't know, organic. They just, as I play, like, I have an idea going in, and they just morph and become who they're going to become. So yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. I I played on a live stream with um, our good friends at um, STF, and, um, and Allard from Dice Crisis was on the cast as well. And this one was run by Tyler from the MinMax show. And... I went into that game. We all decided to play dragons. Like it was, we 25 North had just gotten, you know, we were just starting off. I think we were like 10 episodes and they invited me on. And again, we want to highlight third party products. So I was like, Hey, dragons just came out. Let's play dragons. You know, this is Mark Seifter. This is, um, you know, it's balanced. Let's play dragons. And so we all played dragons. So Heath and my Heath from STF and myself, we decided to partner up on a backstory that we were friends. And the intention for that was he was going as the gambler. He was basically uh, building his character off of uh, Doc Holliday from Tombstone as as brilliantly portrayed by Val Kilmer. And I was going in there as just um, Sal, who was supposed to be kind of um you know, like a forager, like the, his name was Salvager. He was going to be in like, you know, kind of like the gutter trash, like always grabbing stuff. And for some reason I get on the show and out of nowhere, like the dude bro accent, it just came out of me <laughs> and I had no intention of doing that. Um, and so I, I organically to your point, Rachel, is yeah. I leaned in heavily into dude bro and to the himbo mentality like he was all like he was my character wasn't dumb like he actually had an intelligence of plus three but like the way i portrayed him was as kind of like um the himbo yeah you know and it just came organically mm -hmm. and um 
sometimes the best parts of a character are the ones you don't plan for. The ones that just happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think there's a lot to be said about that organic growth. Um, Rizzerk has come out differently than even I planned he would, but I think that's the normal way that characters develop in a game. Um, especially if you're much like myself, more a role play oriented person. Um, his interactions with the party are directly affecting which feats and spells he's taking. Um, because while I planned on him having some like healing capability, my most recent feat, I had no intentions of ever taking. Um, but getting down to the role play and the necessity, it became something that was needed. But in my mind, Rizzerk was uh, an even grumpier old man um, in creation. And he's turned into kind of this goofy weirdo in my mind um, that always has some sort of strange story from, uh, you know, the before times mm -hmm. that he likes to bring up. But none of it really is a core facet to him in the personality. Um, if you look at the roadmap I've kind of drawn out for his backstory, it would make sense, but I think it would also be surprising at the same time. And we all find those surprises in our characters as we're playing them. Um, it's, it's fun because being a GM, I never know if what Rizzerk is saying, and I think the party feels this way too, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel. I never know if his stories are real or made up. Like, is it, is it, or is it like hyper exaggerated, like the big fish story, mm -hmm. you know, is it real or is he just like, did he just make this up? Well, especially. <laughs> I, lo I love that. One of our first Rizzerk moments was when we were in the temple and he just, Corey just started making up random shit about the statues. And I was like, don't, like, I'm pretty sure Rizzerk doesn't know this, but, and that's just continued that you play an excellent line between bullshitting and, like, actual knowledge, which is I, um, fun. I like to think I've taken the unreliable narrator feat is the best <laughs> way I could think of it. It's like, yeah. some yeah. of this info might yeah. be true, but mm -hmm. some of it, who knows? And a lot of the time, I don't think Rizzerk exactly knows. Um, but there's a lot of pride there uh, yeah. in that character. Um, and, you know, the pride won't necessarily let him back down, except for when he comes across beings that are clearly more intelligent than him, like Procta. Um, Rizzerk really likes Procta because he can just take these magic things to her and she'll tell him what they are. Like, that's great. Um, he never a hundred years would have thought that was going to happen. Um, instead, he would have just kept carrying them around and hoping that they worked one day. <laughs> So, or trying to sell them as something much, much greater than they were. It's that, that line between, um, I don't know if I've ever said it officially in any of the recordings, but a lot of Rizzerk's inspiration comes from two places. Uh, one, a certain Dr. Newt Gringwich from the Pacific Rim series, um, who's kind of a fanatical scientist. And the Flasher from Hercules. Hey, you want to buy a pocket watch? Ah, um, yeah. yeah. You want a sundial? Um, those are the two places that a lot of Rizzerk's foundations came from. Um, whether or not they shine through more so than, you know, hey, you want a sundial, um, it's really hard to say. But developing a character beyond influences is important. Because I, I think all of us have probably run into... Uh, a player or you know, a companion at one point or another who has this concept of their character that they are so steadfast locked into that there's no flex or flow. Um, for example, I briefly played with a, a gentleman who brought in um, like a Taldoran high noble um, like fencer built swashbuckler to what was it? War, uh, war for the crown or something like that so the character was fundamentally wrong for the ap and then was played as a very arrogant um sort of i'm better than the party i'm better than the nobility 
kind of sense and it just didn't fit um and actually ended up creating tension within the party rather than flow do you find yourselves adjusting things in your mind often to make sure that they're going to fit within the party dynamic or do you find that through your experience you've hit a point where you kind of know those ins and outs without having to consciously think of them uh the example i'm thinking of that I think speaks to what you're saying. I play in my in-person game. I have a character. They're leshy, but they hate. When I created them, they hated all things nature. And, you know, didn't want anything to do with the fae, anything to do with nature. And then the party, you know, wanted to go into the fae forest. So there was definitely that moment where it was like, well, if I play my character how I thought, they would just leave. But that's, you know, you, you want to play with the group. So I definitely had to do, as you're saying, of the readjustment and dig deeper into the character of what could be a motivation that would make them actually go into this. How can I adjust this character and their motivations and make it make sense without abandoning the character completely? I think to add to that, by the time this hits the feed for folk, the episode will have will have been around um, for the early access folks. It'll probably be, it'll been around like a week that they'll, they'll have access to the episode for the people on the main feed. It'll be a month, but we just, we just came across that exa- same exact situation with Rizzerk in the caves mm, where, um, and so that I want to, I want to turn that question back to Corey. Um, how, I mean, you, you, you clearly, if you wanted to play Rizzerk, Steadfast, and Hardlined, like, he would have just bailed. But obviously, we were doing this for a podcast. We're doing this for the story. You're there for the party. So what was Rizzerk's mentality during that situation with the Shale Spitters? So it was one of those moments where he, I, we um, definitely considered just taking off you know, casting a big wall of water to ride out of that cave like I was surfing. Um, But at the same time, Rizzerk has been alone for a very long time. And this group doesn't treat him like some sort of strange monstrosity. So it's hard for him to just turn his back on them. But at the same time, that was not a good situation for him. And if somebody had dropped in that secondary room... Unless Rodin had drugged them back out to Rizzerk, Rizzerk wasn't moving. He was um, frozen in spot, is probably how I would describe it. Um, Which is interesting to come to, because Rizzerk is uh, 400, and I finally picked his age. Uh, He's over 400 years old, and has been through some situations that... You know, I've kind of hinted at a few. Me and Jason Jason and I have discussed a couple of them. Um, and it's interesting to see how they're going to shape and inform him as a character and as a person. Like, um, I quite, I very rarely think of my characters as characters. They're, they're people, they exist to me at this point. And that may be a delusional way to look at role-playing games, but I feel like it's also immersive and a lot of people can find solace in becoming something or someone else for an extended period of time. Um, For me, I am not one to back down generally, so it's hard for me not to charge right in. But much like Jason, I prefer to play those support classes. Healers, um, my longest-running character is an alchemist who is 100% buff-based, um, so yeah, it's that, that line where it's like, yeah, Rizzerk wanted to run away. Mentally, I was going, okay, do I run away? But what about the party? What about these companions that Rizzerk's getting to know? Um, and I think, I think to add to that is what we brought up earlier is that it brings up a compelling, a compelling drama for that character in the party where, you know, our, our, our primary, our primary thesis here is, is what makes a compelling character 
a three-dimensional character, a character with depth, rather than, um, you know, just a, a, a stat block. And those moments right there, those moments of drama where, you know, the character clearly has to make a choice. And I'm not part of your in-person game, Rachel, but mm-hmm. I, I I am assuming and I could I could guarantee that that choice that your character made added to the character and potentially the party dynamic, right? Right, yeah. Let's you know the character on a deeper level when they face those choices, I think. And same thing with Rizzerk that just happened. I mean, we're only two episodes away from, at this point in time when we're talking, only only one more episode has happened since that interaction with Rizzerk and the Shale Spitters. But I, I, there was already immediately right there where Roden's like, hey, are you okay, buddy? And and so it was like, hey, you know, they were, they were just two young baby shell spitters. And we're just like, oh, oh, shit, okay. Well, they're just two babies. Um, they can get much bigger. And so it's adding, it's seeding a little bit of a plot element while also adding drama and character interaction, which I think is those bits of drama and char- character interaction fundamentally add to making the the character much more grounded, much more believable, much more three-dimensional, as opposed to just a stat block where, you know, you're just rolling dice and doing the math. Sure. It's what makes it role-playing and not, like, miniatures or something where you're yeah, just, we're not, you we're know. not playing a combat miniatures war game. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd be terrible at those. I've never given it a shot, but <laughs> I can already tell not for me. Too much math. I love risk, but still too much math. Oh, risk is I've... just rolling dice against dice, though. It's easy. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I have the problem when I do play miniatures that I try to role play my characters. And it's like, well, you know, I played Star Wars miniatures. And I'm like, Luke Skywalker wouldn't do that. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's I, not I'd, role playing. I think I'd have the same issue for sure. Yeah. Um, well, and I think everybody's starting to have those little depth and character defining moments. Um, prior to the shale spitters, um, Rizzer took the eye patch in which I, I think was a bit of a shock to everybody. And that was one of those like serious thought moments where everything was playing out. Rizzer was up top trying to stay alive. Um, and I was thinking, and it's like, okay, where would he be at this moment? He hasn't been challenged in a very long time. He's angry now. What does a dragon who used to burn villages do when he's angry? He lashes out. Um, So those little lions that now I know that exists within Rizzerk, there's no saying he won't do it again. That being said, based on the party's reaction, he may think twice about it. Um, And adding that level is really interesting. It's not something you necessarily plan for. Yeah, I, I I agree. When those when those moments of drama happen organically as opposed to when they're prefabricated. I'm not saying that prefabricated can be bad. I mean, the cold opens are inherently prefabricated moments of drama. But at the table, when they happen organically, it just feels more impactful if that makes any sense for me um for me yeah i ran into a moment like that a couple times where you're put up against a would your character actually do do this would they if you're really hardline role-playing your character when they just walk away and I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who hasn't played it, but there was a moment in my game last night where my wizard, who is um, worships a lawful evil deity, was asked if they would consecrate the church of a lawful good deity. And immediately got reactions like, no, why? Why? But, you know, you think about it, at least for me, I I had to think about it for a second. And, you know, 
my mentality and my um, the way I justified it to myself was that in a world with dozens upon dozens upon dozens of deities, having a worshiper who is monotheistic, who worships one deity um, uh, against all others, is not. It's not. It's not reliable. It's not factual. It, it just. It wouldn't exist. Most characters in this world would probably worship multiple deities. And given that my character is a dwarf, and though Asmodeus is his primary deity, it isn't because he believes in the evil tenets of Asmodeus, is that Asmodeus's domains are confidence and discipline and passion and he is an academic. He needs that confidence, that discipline, that passion. But he's also a dwarf, so he grew up worshiping Torag. Um, and so he has a bit of respect for Torag. And so that was how I justified it in my mind. And it adds a little bit of el- element, like I mentioned. Um, the party knows that he's an Asmodian. But the party also knows that for some reason, he tried to consecrate this lawful good temple of Torag. So it, adding layers to the character. Um, and it's we only had one session, so I'm sure it'll come back up. So, Yeah, well, and I, I think that there's still a conversation to be had in-game about the Shale Spitters with Rizzerk. But he's not ready to have that while we're still in this cave, is kind of how that's going to shake out. Um But alignment is another one of those things that's really tricky when you're trying to bring it into a character. Because too many people will look at it and go, okay, I am lawful evil. And then with that, it's, I am, it just becomes, I am evil as long as I follow the laws of this one church or doctrine. It's easy to get typecast by yourself when it comes to alignment and faith and religion inside TTRPGs. Um, It's... I know Rizzerk has a god on his sheet. I don't remember what god it is, because that's how little it actually matters to him. Um, But if you ask him, there's no denying the fact that this world is full of gods. Um, And yeah, he's heard about dozens of them, maybe even more. He may have worshipped a few of them over the years, but none of them were quite right for him. And I think that's something that can be said with alignments, too, is that they're not something that's steadfast and locked in, but something that changes and is shaped and grows as the character does. Yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. It's I. The way I try to describe alignment and Rachel's heard this before, and you've all heard this before if you hang out with me on Discord, the alignment is it's just a compass. It's, it's, it's a direction on a compass. It's, it's just a reference. It's a reference for your character's um, social and societal norms and beliefs, but it is not concrete. It doesn't have to be concrete and it shouldn't be concrete. Um, alignment doesn't, you don't have to be, beholden to it it should just be there to inform to your point how do you how do you think of alignment rachel yeah i'd say it shifts i mean i've got old school first ed as always in my head since that's what i grew up playing and so whenever alignment gets talked about i do hearken back to which i don't know i don't know if this was a rule or house rule but if a cleric did something against their alignment and against their god they got their powers taken away like they had to go through atonement to get their stuff back so which obviously clerics are a exception to the rule you know they're actually getting their powers from a deity um well i think to add to that i think what 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 second edition did brilliant brilliantly is they got rid of that being tied to alignment mm. and they had tied and they tied that to anathema and yeah, yeah. and and beliefs, I think, is it is it, is it beliefs and anathema? But yeah, either way. Um, so it's certain actions that your characters right. would almost always take, and certain actions that your characters should almost never take. I think in both of those lines, almost is being being the one. 
because ultimately the GM has the decision. Um, I'm sure there are situations where a character would do something completely anathema mm-hmm. to their deity, but they would still retain their powers because their de- their deity are omnipotent, you know, right? And they can see that hey, ultimately this was done for the betterment. It was a choice. To, um, that ultimately led to a more positive outcome, even though in that in that moment a negative thing right. happened. Well, and alignment is somewhat a way to express morality, right? Your value mm-hmm. or devalue of life, and just like in real life, morality is subjective. I can say something's you know evil but justified, or you know so good but maybe, you know, had bad motives behind it. So, just like real life, alignment's subjective. It's a good guiding point, a good reference to fall back on if you're trying to figure out what your character's going to do or how they feel, but it's not this, black and white. This might ultimately be a discussion for another mutiny. I was going to say, we could have a whole discussion on yeah. theology and alignment within... Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's Because there's a movement... Um, that I've looked into a couple times where some GMs are completely doing away with alignment. Mm. They're saying that's like, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter anymore and it shouldn't be tied to characters. And it's a fascinating point of conversation. But yeah. we, we, that's, that's, that's something that's much deeper and it's, we could talk 90 minutes on that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of those things that uh, I think Johnny would probably have some interesting insights into that. Uh, especially when it comes to things like, I don't know if it's changed with second edition, but with first edition, you couldn't be a good barbarian. Like a lawful good barbarian just wasn't an option. Mm -hmm. And you had to be a good paladin other than there was one archetype that allowed you deviate from that. And you had Um, to be a lawful monk. Yes. Um, So there was a lot of that being locked into alignment in first edition. I don't know if that carries over to second edition so much no Um, no but it it forced some choices that's for sure yeah they they've i think and to the point of that larger discussion that that we'll have is they've kind of stepped away from that you can be a lawful barbarian you can be a lawful bard you can be a lawful thief you can be a chaotic champion now you don't have to be a it's lawful, a lawful yeah. champion. You could be a chaotic champion, and a monk is. They got rid of just. They just got rid of the lawful part of it. It's like you could be a monk of any alignments now. So, I yeah, think just punching things. Exactly, you're just punching things. Um, so I think there is a mechanical step back from alignments, at least when it comes to restriction of mechanics but for the purposes of role playing I still think that alignment is quite helpful at least as some kind of guiding star yeah that is super fair so we've talked about how we come up with our ideas for a character we've talked about alignment Uh, what other things have we touched on I don't want to double back accidentally I should have made a Notes as I went along, but that would have been too smart for 10.30 in the morning. <sighs> uh, I don't know about things that we've touched on, but something that was briefly mentioned that I was going to further question you on. I heard you say Reserk's, uh backstory outline. So when I write a character, I write a few paragraphs about their backstory. And then as I play the character, I'll think of more paragraphs to add to the backstory. Do you, I know you both like to write backstories i believe is a true statement how much of your backstory do you like to lock into so as as a matter of fact as soon as this calls over my i should be editing episode 30 but i'm going to end up writing a backstory and spending a couple hours writing a backstory for a character i'm playing in the play by post um uh that the voice of harold uh jeff he is running us through a play by post of mummy's mask Oh, right um, on. Yeah. So I think for me, I tend, I very much outline as opposed to writing full um, paragraphs and sentence blocks. Is I'll, I'll outline like main, primary, 
core memory, if to speak like the movie Inside Out, core memory bullet points for that character. And from there, I will flesh those out if it becomes meaningful in the campaign. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's much the same for me. So I don't have... I think I've got one paragraph that is like the basic... Rizerk is this old, he is this size, you know, he is from this region. And that's in a paragraph. But otherwise, anything else I write is a bullet point that'll say, was on a pirate ship 15 years ago, was in the village of Grundvine 60 years ago, um, did this at this point. Um, and I've got about 45 of those bullet points that I can pull from and reference if I need to but none of them I would describe as core facets of him. So as we advance, I'm constantly removing things because it's like, yeah, that's no longer relevant to the character. Um, I read, I think it was on the Angry GM, as much as some of his takes I'm not a fan of, some of them are quite insightful. And he wrote an article about the one, uh, what was it, the one-line backstory um, that I read that really changed the way that I looked at it. And essentially what he was saying, if I remember correct, was that you can write seven pages of notes on your character, but the second you land in a party and somebody else's character says something weird or interesting, or you end up in a different environment that you're not expecting, half of that backstory is going to go out the window anyways. So just save your time and enjoy playing the character instead of worrying about what the character did 15 years ago. Um, which I think a lot of people get hung up on, especially if you're trying to create a a character with depth, is you think you need to know all these details. I need to know who their family was, where they're from, what they love, what they hate, you know, what bad things, what good things have happened to them. But I don't think that that's necessarily true for building a well-rounded character. If you have one key event that you can use as your catalyst into creating your character. Um, For Rizzerk, it's him becoming small, him becoming humanoid. That is the key catalyst that completely changed his world. Everything before that, and most of the things since that, really aren't that important, other than the fact that I used to be a full-sized adult dragon, and now I am a medium-sized creature that walks upright. I think that that split is what makes him that weird kind of zany character because his brain lies in two pieces and they're not the same as each other. Um, I had imagine it's much like trying to live without hearing or sight after having it for 30 to 40 years of your life. You're going to change. I think that's just inevitable. Um, so don't lock yourself into to backstories, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I got a little long-winded there, but that's kind of my thing. <laughs> Yeah, get a idea of who your character is without the specifics. Uh, kind of, maybe. That sounds about right. Yeah. One line summary. That's what I'll do. I do remember the first time I played, I guess what I'd call modern role playing, as opposed to old school. Um, I, you know, they handed me a character sheet. I don't even remember what system it was. And right on there's a line of like weaknesses, strengths, like like job application. And I was like, what? the hell is this i'm not i'm not writing a specific phobia or something it was just so weird to me that you'd do that i don't know not that it's not useful if that's a key part of your character just like that you'd have to have that you know i'd rather be playing and have it organically happen and i think some some properties lend themselves better to that than others like uh call of cthulhu and delta green having those contacts so i know with delta green you have a couple of people that you write down family members spouse whatever that you can contact to remove stress call of cthulhu having those phobias is something that the gm can take and just completely warp Mm -hmm. and twist core to the Um, system Mm -hmm. and even more so if we look at pathfinder i think strange aeons is another system that that can really play into or not system AP that that can really play into because you've got a lot of that eldritch horror you know stuff happening in your dreams weird mind things 
Um, so it lends well to that. But some games, not so much. Like my Jade Regent Alchemist, um, the closest thing to a phobia I ever wrote for her is that she's too trusting of people. And that I wrote as one of her weaknesses. And I think that was a conversation we actually had during our initial little interview before the before the episode started airing was weaknesses and strengths of characters. And I cannot remember what I said at all at this point. Mm -hmm. So it just shows how much characters can shift. Yeah, I do. I sort of along those lines and I know we're going to wrap up here in, in a few minutes. Um, one of the questions I wanted to pose to you two is something that I've been considering for a while. And when it comes to characters and those kinds of builds and stuff is the idea of your character having a goal and a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some kind of motivation. And what happens if and when that character reaches that goal and that mo motivation? The reason I bring this up is it's a mechanic in the card board game Gloomhaven. Where once your character reaches that goal, they retire. And they go off and live a life of luxury because they have a crap ton of gold. And they've reached their purpose. They've reached their goal. Uh, and I'm wondering about in TTRPGs, is that something that would be interesting? I think it adds a, quite a bit to the concept of a character, but also kind of pulls away from the idea of the heroic adventurer. You know, you're going to save, ultimately, like saving the world is a much larger goal, and it should take priority over, you know, how I can't I can't think of one of getting uh, avenging the death of a family member, and once that's done, that's done. You've reached it. All right, I wipe my hands of it. Y'all can save the world, and I'm just gonna go live the rest of my life. Yeah, for sure. It's actually one of the things that um, I'll give the crew over at Critical Role credit for is they're really good about setting those goals with characters. And each character has their own little plot they're working on. And then when they finish their goal, that character will retire or just be done. And they'll bring somebody else in new. Um, sure, it's essentially the only way they bring new characters into that that uh, property. But it's interesting seeing it played out on a large scale, especially with such large visibility. Um, Rizark's goals, I won't get into them too deeply, but his goals don't necessarily 100% align with the party other than as a stepping stone. So for him, he doesn't think he's going to get where he wants to be before the party splits up and goes their separate ways as they always do. Um, so he doesn't, or I don't see him leaving the party due to goals. That being said, I my alchemist I've mentioned, Eileen, um, she is a knowledge fiend. And once she acquires the knowledge that she's looking for and the ability to use some of the spells that she's had since level one, um, she's kind of checked out. She is along for the caravan ride to get what she wants out of them. And then I will actually likely retire her, even though she's been with the campaign for, you know, we're coming up on book four now. She came in about halfway through book one. Um, so she's got some deep ties, but her goals are her own. Yeah, I don't, I feel like I usually don't have, if I have a specific goal, usually the campaign, I do recently, I play APs, but in my past it was homebrew. So usually if I have a specific goal, upon meeting it, there's some new hook, right? That builds on that goal or changes that goal that keeps the character in it. And only rarely... The only character I can think of that retired, it, again, was just a very organic thing. That was my Barbarian and Jason's uh, Wayward Wonders, right? Extinction Curse. Extinction yeah. Curse, yeah. Um, that, you know, 
he was only along, or they, he was, they, they were only along for the ride because another, they cared about another party member and that other party member, you know, they were going to go, they were going to protect them. That party member died. And it was like, I like, again, organically, I, I have no reason to do this anymore. I'm leaving. So I prefer it when I prefer it apparently everything when it just happens on its own it makes sense in the moment um so no planning I ahead i think that's part of the beauty of ttrpgs is that it's it's all just in the moment like other than you know every once in a while i might message well i haven't done it yet with this game but i'm sure you guys will get the message where it's hey i'm gonna corner you today for some role play be ready for it like this is what i'm gonna ask you but I don't think that I'd ever want to plan out the conversation with somebody other than for something like the cold opens, which are great because they allow you to um, convey precise information or imprecise information, if that's what you desire. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a lot of what's the right word I'm looking for. Chance randomness, um, interesting opportunity for growth that can be found in a role-playing setting. I I always like to describe tabletop games as choose-your-own-adventure books for adults, but instead of page numbers, you use dice. Um, that's how I generally describe Pathfinder and you know, Pathfinder to people who have no clue what it is, or I tell them to you know just check it out or I'll run them. My favorite thing to do is run first timers because there's no preconceptions. They just want to try it out. Um, and it's, it's beautiful um, running first timers who genuinely want to play, but don't know what they're doing. Right on. Anything else? No, I think we've talked about about a dozen different topics, um, all of them <laughs> that come down to the fact that building a character that is organic and feels right comes down to, I think, a willingness to be flexible um, at your table with whoever you're with, and uh, just a willingness to kind of explore things you may not normally or things that you would. Um, don't lock yourself in. Have some fun with it. It's just a game. Um, All right. Closing any, this off? Yeah, I guess so. Anybody have any final statements before we wrap up this road? That's not a saying. <laughs> <sighs> we wouldn't have caught it. Uh, no, that sounded like a good summary to me. All right. Well, this has been another episode of 25 North Mutiny. Wrap Thanks up your for road. Joining us. Yeah, wrap up your road and, uh, you know, make sure to anchor your car and uh, make sure to check the tires on your boat before you head out today. Um, thanks for joining us. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.